All right, music fans, welcome back. Harmless Dave here talking real music in real time for real people just like you and just like me. You know that famous Eagles documentary, History of the Eagles? It's like three hours plus if you watch the entire thing. I think there were two parts originally, and I think they've kind of combined it. So if you go on like, you know, uh, Amazon or uh, Quello, whatever it's called, you can watch the entire thing from start to finish. And in the first eight minutes, you know, things are going along great, but around the eight minute mark, that's when they find their villain. Um, Glenn Fry said prior to that, that for the most part, you know, 90% of the time being in the Eagles, it was a bleeping blast, you know, and that was kind of weird. Um, it was awkward and uncomfortable when he used the F bomb there. I'm not going to lie. Um, it's an interesting movie. There's, there's some parts where there's, there's nudity and then there's not, it's not for very long, but it's weird. It's uncomfortable. It's like, we're going to try to shock you with some of this footage of the band at their most debauched moments and so forth. Um, but the real object lesson of this movie was to make Don Felder the villain at the eight minute mark. You hear that famous audio from the uh, long night at Long Beach, where <laughs> both um, Fry and Felder are going at it. They're yelling at each other. At one point, Glenn Fry says, you know, I've been paying you for seven years or something like that. And that kind of just, you know what that makes me think? That makes me think that um, Felder's arguments about being just this hired gun, and I don't think I was hired to be this way, but yet it's evolved into me just doing what they're telling me to do, uh, pumping gas at the uh, Henley gas station, you know, a famous quote from his book that you're just pump. And I think it was Joe Walsh maybe who coined that phrase or who knows, maybe Randy Meisner. I don't know. The, the point is, is that Felder wanted a bigger piece of the action. He felt that he was contributing in a way that was really helping the group. And you can't really argue with the music to Hotel California. Forever, that's going to be their signature song. You know, prior to Hotel, they were still a great band, but they supposedly wanted to rock out more. I don't know if they really accomplished their goal of rocking out more. If you listen to the material they did before Hotel, most of it is pretty mellow stuff, but that's the stuff that has sold them the most records. Hotel itself sold a ton of records as well, but other than Victim of Love and Life in the Fast Lane, two tracks, um, they kind of stuck to the same formula, except they got more refined. They toned the country elements down. Same thing that Poco did on their album, which came out, I think, a year after. They, they turned the country elements down and, and made it more contemporary while still kind of holding on to some of that twang, some of that feeling and flavor. But, um, and it was a smart move by them because that was their most successful album. Um, an album called, I believe Legend was the name of it. Um, had that horse logo album cover. And uh, <laughs> little did they know, you know, that they would have their most successful album after giving up Tim Schmidt, after giving up Randy Meisner, uh, to the Eagles. Poco, like I say in a couple of videos, very important to the formation, the foundation of the Eagles. Um, the Eagles basically took like the Poco template and, you know, made it more adult contemporary, made it little, a little less country, a little less cow pokey. And it worked. It worked. And, you know, Poco caught on a little late in their career. If they could have figured that out, like in 1972, or something, they could have been neck and neck with the Eagles. I mean, they have amazing players in that group or over the years. I mean, Richie Fure and uh, their drummer, George Grantham was a great drummer. Um, Paul Cotton and uh, Rusty Young. I mean, those are just real top musicians, no question about it. And then they had a couple of Englishmen come in later on and really helped refine their sound. But getting back to the whole Eagles, Felder deserving um, maybe better than he got in the documentary. Of course, this is after Felder wrote the book, Heaven and Hell, My Life in the Eagles, and 
uh, airing all of the dirty laundry that Don Henley was singing about back in the early 80s, just putting it on out there. I heard Henley was not too happy with that. And still, even after the documentary came out, uh, was still griping about the way um, Felder had just done this tell-all book. Well, the documentary, I think, was designed to throw Felder under the bus to make him the villain. Eight minutes in, we got uh, all of that stuff from Long Beach. And then as the movie progresses, you know, there are little bits and pieces here and there which signal that there was a problem in the Eagles. And there was band turmoil. Now, they didn't talk about the turmoil between, say, Don Henley and Glenn Fry, because it was there, and Felder talked about it, and it's alluded to a little bit, but back in you know the early 80s, I don't know if Glenn Fry was all super happy about Don Henley singing the majority of the songs. You know, in the movie, he says, there was a reason why we have Don Henley singing, and I'm not singing as much, and that was real gracious and so forth. When the Eagles came out with the Long Road Out of uh, Eden album in 2007, Glenn Fry was singing a lot more on that album than he had uh, on the prior two studio records. And, um, and of course, this doesn't include uh, Hell Freezes Over, where there were a few tracks, unreleased songs or new songs that were coupled with the live songs. But I think uh, Henley and Fry had come to an agreement like, yeah, why don't we just split the singing duties here? Um, not knowing that that was their last album together. And I think it was a good way for Glenn to kind of reassert his position in the band. The first single, which was a tune that they had done with J.D. Souther years ago called How Long. I mean, they traded vocals on it, but Fry is kind of the lead singer. Henley sings parts and Fry sings. It's kind of like a duet, but, um, and which is something that they probably should have done more of, have those two really great voices. They never really utilized that as much as they could have. I think um, they missed opportunities by making it just Henley and not as much Fry or just Fry some of the time. So getting back to Felder and the documentary, so yeah, they have Felder in there as the villain most of the time. They, they're, they're about to focus more and more on him. There's a portion where he's literally in tears because he misses his band. He misses being in that band, but he did make his own bed and he decided that he was gonna fight for what he thought was right. But of course they didn't see it that way. They just looked at him as a troublemaker, um, just sit down and be quiet. Joe Walsh said at one point, not in the documentary, but um, apparently in a conversation he had with Felder, you know, just sign the contract, just sign the contract. And, you know, um, these guys, look, Joe Walsh, you know, he, he played it right to some degree. He was a go along company man. Maybe he thought really fortunate that he was uh, in the Eagles. He got to do his solo career as well which I think is kind of an added bonus for Joe Walsh, but nothing's going to compare to what he did in the Eagles, although people love the James gang and they loved his work, you know, in Barnstorm and then coming out as just a plain old solo artist over time. I think the quality of his material was not going up. It was going down. And I think that had more to do with Joe's uh, issues with substances and so forth than anything else. Cause I think he's enormously talented and uh, but he was more of a team player. Uh, he didn't care. He wanted to be on the Eagles team and um, his relationship with Don and Glenn um, was rock solid because he was a company man. Felder wanted to see how the sausage was being made and he couldn't do that. And that's why Felder get fired. And that's why he's kind of like the focus of this movie to some degree, because it's like, yeah, the turmoil, mostly this guy over here. If he had just done what he was told and been a company man, 
things would have been fine. And it wouldn't have been 90% of the time. It would have been a hundred percent of the time being in the Eagles. Cause again, it would have been interesting to hear about the struggles that maybe Glenn and Don were having, or maybe there were some other dynamics in the group. I know Tim Schmidt was another go along to get along. G, you know, I'm out of Poco. I'm not making like a hundred bucks a week anymore. I'm making like a hundred thousand. I don't know, not a week, but you know, he, the money went up exponentially. And that was one of the things they said in the documentary, you know, that, Hey, we rescued this guy from playing these dive bars and now he's on the road and he's before, you know, tens of thousands of people. But the moral of this entire thing is that um, Felder probably deserved better than he got. I keep saying that over and over again. And that over time, as Don Henley once sang, I think it's about forgiveness. Um, and there's never been any forgiveness. I mean, as people get older, imagine if they all got in the studio together. You know, what's left of the group? Glenn's not there, which is a tragic thing. And it might be better because, you know, Felder and Glenn didn't hit it off all that well. I, I know that Don Henley most recently, probably four or five years ago, said that, you know, he was still just hyper ticked off at uh, Felder about the book and uh, books out of the barn, can't put it back in the barn. So in any event, um, that's my little story about the Eagles documentary. Uh, it's more just making Don Felder the villain throughout. Yeah, there is a lot of good history and a lot of great footage and it ends up being a lot about the music, but there are people who, you know, left the band and probably because the people at the top weren't easy to deal with. And that was Randy Meisner, Bernie Ledden, and Felder who didn't want to leave, but ended up being fired. Um, and it just seems as though these guys would use these guys, abuse them to some degree, and then, you know, kind of create their own narrative um, that they could control. And you see that a lot today, the competing narratives, you know, the history of whatever rock band, and they're all basically trying to put their side of the story out there. And people say, yeah, I like this band because they got rid of so-and-so and he were, he was a troublemaker, whether it was Dennis DeYoung or Lindsey Buckingham, you can go down the list of different people and think to yourself, is that really true? Or is this just so um, people will go and see them play concerts? Right now, it doesn't matter because nobody's doing concerts. But when they start doing it again, if they do, the narratives will reappear, even if the people in question have moved on. And for Don Felder, you know, he has moved on. He's had a pretty decent solo career since leaving the Eagles. His name ID is much higher than it used to be when he was in the Eagles. So yeah, there's a silver lining and good for him because he just, you know, he seems like a really nice guy. Whether you think he was right to do what he did or not, he does seem like a decent guy. So that's my super long video on this topic. I know people um, are always interested in the Eagles because they are a fascinating group of people. And uh, we do miss Glenn Fry, even if he was um, yelling at Don Felder a lot, we still miss him. And we wish uh, he was still here with us and out on tour with the Eagles the last few years, I think um, would have been awesome, but we got Vince Gill. Yay, Vince Gill. Woo. -hoo. 